are you your own worst enemy? I do not know what title to give this article to get your attention to read this point. Possibly improve your chances of gaining some vital knowledge, pleasing God and probably saving your soul. It is the explanation of an incident I had with a female Christian. We are told in Hosea 4 verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. My purpose of this teaching, as are all my teachings, I am guided by James 5, chapter 5, verse 20. Let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way, his or her way, shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. I will try and keep this point short. I sent out a study titled um, I was on Revelation chapters 14 to 16, titled Entole, is the essential meaning. Entole is a Greek word for commandment, or sorry, it's a word which the English has translated as commandment. And there's many Greek and Hebrew words that the English have put into the same word commandment, and it's to show that there is a difference if you look at it in the Greek than if you look at it just in the English word commandment. Anyway, I sent her that article and I received a following comment from this lady. I have inserted numbers into her comment to correspond with my reply to it, so I don't have to keep re um, referring back to the part of her reply to which I'm addressing. She said, I don't know why your version of what you do to be saved is so complicated. Read Romans chapter 10 verse 8 to 13. Note verse is 9 and 13. This is all you have to do. Ephesians 2 verse 8, salvation is a gift from God. All gifts are free. Romans 5 verse 8, we were sinners when Yeshua or Jesus to her died for us. We did not have to fix ourselves up first to be acceptable to receive the gift of salvation. This is what the Bible teaches me, not passed down religious I think she means religion. And what does God say true religion is? Um, she refers to James 1.27. So it's what James actually said, not God. Now, if I address each point comprehensively, um, it will take pages. So I will merely mention some points and hope you get the message. If you have been following my daily Genesis to Revelations post from the 1st of January, which I do every year, taken through to um, covering the whole Bible as to what's needed for salvation, you can find it on Facebook under the name of Reesky, R-E-I-C-E-G-U-Y. So if you've been following those studies um, last year and again in 2020 and starting again 1st of January 2021, you should have noticed numerous ifs, conditions, showing the recipients of God's gifts had to meet a condition. For example, Adam and Eve did not have to eat, were not told it was to told not to eat of the fruit. God told Cain in Genesis chapter 4 verse 7, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. Even though Noah had never seen rain, he acted on the instructions of God. The instruction God gave him. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, it says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. My last example, even from just the first book of the Bible, Genesis, is chapter 17, verse 1, speaking of Abraham, and it says, And when Abraham was ninety years old and nine, Yahweh appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect and I will and he carries on so that is the precept obedience to plus faith in God's instructions the do this and I will do something else so I booked 
an appointment with the lady or with the woman and even offered a huge financial incentive to get her to listen because I know what people like they don't want to hear anything against what they believe so if it was for her own good I offered things not really for the point of the sake of our offering anyway when I arrived she said she had not listened to the first minute she had sorry she had only listened to the first minute of this study on revelations title in Tolle. She neither wanted to hear what I had prepared to prove. Now it's not as much as what is in this study, I just elaborated it to make a complete study for listeners. She said her experience was sufficient for her. So first let me address that point about our experiences with two verses. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9 says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and Lying wonders. Second Corinthians chapter eleven verse thirteen says, "For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostle of Christ. They're not chosen by God." Verse fourteen, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. So that means that Satan can give comfort, prosperity, and even answer prayers to keep you satisfied and stay in your ignorance and not change your theology or change your stance. Remember Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 which says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Yahweh God had made, meaning he's very sharp and slippery to get you to do things um, that you think is your own idea. As he did with Eve, actually. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 tells us, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And remember, the other one, he's like a roaring lion, seeking who he can devour. My other one is Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 3, talks about a king, but this king is actually talking about Satan is, the, is the, talking about anyway it says thou art wiser than Daniel there is no secret that they can hide from thee so those are things that tells us about um, how we can be deceived in other words by our experiences Satan offered kingdoms to Messiah in the wilderness and we read in Jeremiah it says in 44 verse 17 people speaking but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, as we have done. We and our fathers, our kings and our princes, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals, meaning goods, and were, we and were well, and saw no evil. Jeremiah 44 verse 18. But since we left off the burnt incest to the Queen of Heaven and pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. Verse 19. And when we burnt incense to the Queen of Heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? In other words, they thought that the good fortune they were having was because they were worshipping idols and worshipping um, the host of heaven, not the queen of heaven, which, by the way, is the Catholic Church the equivalent of Mary. We've got that from. So, in short, the Bible says, the Bible clearly says that we are to go by the word of God, not our experiences. As people can make wrong connections with their experiences, as we just read in Jeremiah. Verse John chapter 4 verse 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. In other words, to deceive. Okay, on to my reply to her 10 points, using the numbers above. Romans chapter 10 verses 8 to 13 is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 11 to 20. And the context actually starts from verse 6 of Romans, speaking of righteousness of faith. 
Paul recites part of the passage of Deuteronomy chapters 30, verse 11 to 14 to explain righteousness of faith. It was the words of God through Moses to Israel, through Moses to Israel who were given commandments and a covenant to keep of Exodus chapters 20, so Exodus chapter 20 to 24, verse 47. That's where it says Moses wrote everything in a book and he sprinkled the blood on the people and made a covenant. So thus the, the Romans, chapter 10, verse 8 to 13, cannot be given a different context than the origins from where it is quoted. It has to also be based on this subsequent verse of Romans in chapter 10, verse 17, only a few verses down. It says, So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, which ties in with where Paul is quoting from, Deuteronomy 30, verse 16, it says, In that I, God speaking, command thee this day, or Moses speaking of what God told him, command thee this day to love Yahweh thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, and his statutes, and his judgments, that thou mayest live, and multiply, and Yahweh thy God shall bless thee in the land where thou goest to possess it. So, the blessings of God was conditional on Israel keeping his commandments, to walk in his commandments and so, so, so. So when God says, and I will do, it's based on what he asked him to do first. As it was with Abraham who had both obedience and the faith. The faith being counted unto him for righteousness. Genesis chapter 26 verse 5. Speaking of Abraham. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. So that is why God had so much favour um, towards Abraham. Because of what he did. And he had the faith. When God told him to do something. The two things Abraham had equals the New Testament believers in Messiah are called to have the same things. As it says in Revelation 14 verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, number one, and the faith of Yeshua, number two. So having faith to call on the name of Yeshua parallels the faith that was called on in the animal sacrifices of Aaron or the priest for the forgiveness of one's sins. In other words, how can killing an animal and sacrificing it to God get rid of a sin that I have done? Because you have faith in because that's what God says he requires. Transgression of God's laws are only forgiven by having word in the criteria he says he accepts as forgiveness or, rep or repentance. So Yeshua is the sin forgiveness law in the flesh, as I've shown in former studies, especially one titled, What's the Commandments Written on Stone? You can find that on fordtoyahweh.com on the sermons section. So, both faith in the animal sacrifices of the priest or in Yeshua, satisfy Romans chapter 10, verses 10. It says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you first believe what God's word, you act in it, and you confess your sins and have faith that you are following the criteria he says he requires to forgive you of, those, of that transgression. Okay, her second point. Verse, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 13. Now these are not isolation qualifying verses. They must be added to other verses of the Bible, as Luke chapter 13, verse 5. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Matthew 10, 22. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Matthew 19, verse 17. The ruler, the rich man, asking Yeshua how to be saved, or sorry, what to get eternal life. And he says, but if thou wilt be into, into life, keep the commandments. 
So if someone says, um, you know, how do I do something? How do I get to a place? And they say one condition, one thing. It doesn't mean that's all you need. Yes, you need, they may, they're just saying that one thing at that time. I can't think of an example, but sometimes, unless they say you only need this or you only need that, we cannot just take that reply in isolation if they have also said other things previously or subsequently, in my point. So, verse 9, verses 9 and 13 are in the context of the surrounding verses which are within the context of their source in Deuteronomy. Paul cannot and did not give them a different context nor meaning. Romans 10 verse 8, but what saith it? So this is what Romans says, and we see exactly the same thing Paul is quoting from in Deuteronomy, or he quoted from Deuteronomy. But what saith it? The word is near thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So Paul calls it the word of faith that was near to them when it was originally said to them. And it's the same message Paul is preaching. It's just that, as Peter says in 2 Peter 3.16, if you are unlearned in the Old Testament, you'll misunderstand Paul and give, it, and give his words a different meaning. So let's see where Paul got it from. Deuteronomy 13.14 But the word is very near unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. So we do the words of God as Deuteronomy. So that's what Paul was referring to. So if sometimes you want to understand what Paul is saying, go back to the source of where he's getting his teachings and you'll go, you get it right. So let's continue from where Paul is, from where Paul is quoting. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. See, I've set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love Yahweh thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his, and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and Yahweh thy God shall bless you. There is the condition. The same condition must be applied to Romans chapters 10 verse 8. So, the, that thou mayest, and the Yahweh shall bless thee, are the conditions to receiving the blessing the gift. It is not free. Her third point, my comment to it. It is sad to realise many Christians are under the, the delusion they only have to call on the name of Yeshua and believe that call on does not require God's commandment keeping. That he is a genie that dishes out the most valuable item of salvation freely. The Bible throughout says the opposite, even to the end, as in Revelation 14 verse 12 and 22 verse 14. Paul himself makes it clear in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 13, chapter 7 verse 19. Speaking of circumcision, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. A teaching matching one in the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Her fourth point, four, five and seven are put together. Though the verse says that salvation is a gift, speaking of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, which part of the verse says it is free, as she claims in her point five? Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For by grace are ye saved, through faith, and, not, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The word free gift is not in the sentence. Do not put it in there. People are constantly reading their interpretation into verses and closing their ears from education on the verse, on, the, on what the verse actually means. Here are two verses of numerous I could cite to show not all gifts are free. I have already shown above things of God are 
or almost always conditional. Exodus chapter 20 verse 6 And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Acts chapter 2 verse 8 When 3,000 were first coming to their Pentecost, at the end of Peter's speech, he says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The prior condition to receiving the gift was repentance meaning sincere regret for past sins and turning away from them onto the keeping of the laws of God. <clears throat> it is not free. Using the words of her point seven, <clears throat> it did not have to fix up themselves, as she says, they first had to fix themselves up. They had to repent to be acceptable to receiving the gift. Similar to Messiah's lessons <clears throat> Sorry, Matthew 9, verse 6, which says, No man putteth a piece of new cloth onto an old garment. And verse 17, Neither do men put new wine into old bottles. So you cannot put the ways of God into a sinful body. You have to, that body has to empty itself of the desire to continue sin. It has to repent. Or using her Ephesians. Chapter 4, verse 24, puts it this way, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Not fake holiness, where you can think you can sin and get a free gift. Christians like to take singular or few verses out of context of their author's whole epistle. Without going into the whole epistle of Ephesians, Paul is clearly writing written to a congregation, sorry, Paul was clearly writing to a congregation who had turned to obeying God's commandments. Ephesians 1 verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Yeshua, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ. Verse 4, according as he have chosen us in him, so according as he have chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame. And we know we told the law is holy and righteous and good and so on. So if you want to study Ephesians, see the two links at the end of this um, article. But to be without blame is to be like John the Baptist's parents in Luke chapters 1 verse 6 which says and they were both righteous before God walking in all the commandments and ordinances of Yahweh blameless so that is how you get blameless to walk in the commandments of God her sixth point Yeshua referred to as Jesus by many but his, his actual name was Yeshua did not die for everyone as she says, or she says for us. So not every us can be justified by him under the us of Romans 5 verse 8. Again, many seekers are always reading themselves into verses that does not relate to them. When they read ye, for example, they insert me. Verses are sometimes specifically speaking to a certain group like the apostles, but they put themselves in it as on this occasion with the word us. Who were the us of Romans 5 verse 8? We see above in Ephesians 1 verse 1, Paul writes to saints and faithful. He was not a Gentile nor lawbreaker, so would not include himself with such to use us. In Romans 1 verse 7, he again uses the word saints. And later we see to whom he's writing. Chapter 7, verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Those who knew the law were either Jews or proselyte converts, as in Acts chapters 2, verse 10, uh, Acts 15, 21, 
1314 and 1326. Simply, they were law keepers or aspiring law keepers. Now I know many will claim John 3.16, whosoever believe, kind of thing. But here are some supporting verses. I won't go into the whoever. Again, it depends on the group to whom the verse is written. It's not written to every reader of it today. It was spoken to Israel and is cited in Acts chapter 3 verse 22 and 7 verse 37. And 7 verse 37. So, Yeshua. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15 tells us, Yahweh thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren, like unto me, Moses speaking. Unto him ye shall hearken. So Moses said that to the congregation that came out of Egypt, the Israelites, yes, and the strangers who attached themselves to them. So the prophet came in fulfillment of that verse. Matthew 15, 24, But he answered and said, This is Yeshua, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That fits in with Deuteronomy 8, 15, 18, 15. Matthew 20, 28, Speaking of Yeshua, to give his life a ransom for many, not every or all, many. 26, Matthew 26, verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, for the remission of sins. And we know that many has to be people that surpass the criteria of Luke 13, 5. I tell ye nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So if you're not a repented person, Yeshua, you cannot be included in the us. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9, again, this is another criteria. And being made perfect, he, Yeshua, became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. To be in the us, you have to be an obedient person of the obey him. Again, single verse of Romans taken out of context. So like Ephesians, I will not disprove her belief by citing numerous other verses of Romans as I have a link um, that goes through the book of Romans titled Romans in Perspective at the end of this study. But I'll give you a few verses for the context for Romans, Epistle of Romans in a, in a whole. Romans 2 verse 3. For not the hearers of the law are justified before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Romans 6.15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Romans 7 verse 12. Wherefore the law is holy. And the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. So we saw in Ephesians we are taught called to be holy. And that is how we come holy by keeping the God the laws. And again this is Paul's writings. The same one she's quoting from in Ephesians. Romans 12 1. I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Romans 12 verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. To line upon lie, precept upon precept, we should see it is not a free gift. Her eighth point, that she doesn't believe, uh, what was the eighth point? Um, religious or religion. The history of Christian beliefs proves what most believe are passed down religious theologies and not the original intention of the Bible writers, especially Paul's. Yet they refuse to follow Paul's advice of 2 Timothy 2.15 and 3.15 which says study to make yourselves approved 
And from a child you'll know the Holy Scriptures, which are, made, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through Christ. So they direct us to study the Old Testament to get wisdom and learn about Christ. Now a few days prior to sending out the Revelations 14-16 to 16 in Tolle um, study, I circulated a video from the birth of Pro about the birth of Protestantism with Pentecostal, Methodist, and all those other denominations, Christian denominations sprung um, out of the Catholic Church. It was done by Martin Luther, a breakaway Catholic priest of the 1500s, which we call the 16th century, and around that era. It was him and that era that formulated the Saved by Faith Only, which this lady woman says she's not following, but yet she is. Theology inherited by today's denominations. Now here are some segments in the video. Here are some segments, which I'll show the video in a minute if you're watching, looking at the video version um, to the study. Now they appear at nine minutes. I think those things are wrong actually. It's nine minutes, 30 seconds, up until 10 minutes, six seconds. Um, 16 minutes, 18 seconds, up until 18 minutes. 28 minutes up until 33 minutes 11 seconds and 35 minutes up until 40 minutes. Uh, they show why Martin Luther came up with this uh, theory of his because the Catholic Church had, well you, 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 you used to see in, in the film yourselves. before the altar of St. John in Latin. Set in a certain wall, you will see two crosses. The iron one, the relics of Peter. Behind the other, of Paul. An act of faith performed there relieves your soul of 17,000 years in place. to see one of the 30 pieces of silver for which Christ was betrayed, for it carries an indulgence of 14,000 years. And the scarlet sanctum, the very stairs that Jesus climbed in the palace of Pontius Pilate. And our Father said on each step earns nine years indulgence. And the step where Christ fell for the Christian to see and do in holy Rome. With these and all the others I have brought, if a pilgrim were to venerate every single relic in our church, he would be forgiven of his time in purgatory. One million nine hundred and two thousand two hundred and two years. Plus 270 days. 
Glory be to God. Amen. Now, Brother Martin. I'm not sure that Christ does. Dear Vicar, I wish I could be the kind of Christian that sees and hears, believes and worships, and there's an end of it. Dr. Luther, relics are not an end of it. They're merely symbols of the holy men and women whose sanctity enables them to intercede in our behalf before God. Symbols, it's true. But is the symbol replacing the meaning? Is the meaning itself lost? If it is, dear Vicar, as I say, if, then we are lost. Lost them down. This is a symbol too. But is it God's supreme gift, his only son we adore? Or is it the splinters of the wood, the rust of the nails? makes the agony of Christ more vivid for the simple Christian. The little peasant with his prayer to St. Christopher for St. Jerry, the poor widow with her tiny Madonna, the soldier going into battle with his rosary, yes, even the Duke with his noble gifts to Christ's church. Would you take all these away? Doctor, you people's priest, cannot afford to shatter their faith by tearing away its visible support. As their priests responsible to God for their souls, can I afford not to? Symbols to inspire devotion, yes. But crutches to uphold a tottering faith? Doctor, when it's all is sudden doubt. This is no sudden doubt, but a growing certainty. Dear Vicar, what little certainty I have you gave to me. You heard my sin. You sent me to Rome to fortify my faith. You sent me to Scripture to find my God. You brought me here to Wittenberg to preach his word. And here in my room, I've been preparing my lectures on the epistle of St. Paul from the Romans. And here, I think I've found the truth at last. And when I found it, it was as though the gates of heaven were open to me. Romans 1.17. Used it here in him day. It's here in him day, for the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so... Worthy vicar, do we find anything here of relics? By faith man lives and is made righteous, not by what he does for himself. Be it adoration of relics, singing of masses, pilgrimages to Rome, purchase of pardon for his sins, but by faith in what God has done for him already through his son. Dr. Martin, if you leave the Christian to live only by faith, if you sweep away all good works, all these glorious things you dismiss as mere crutches, what will you put in that place? Christ. Man only needs Jesus Christ.
How we are to pay Michelangelo for the Sistine Chapel, we do not know. As for Master Raphael, we owe him thousands already. But God has given us the papacy. Let us employ it for his glory and his joy while we live. I am determined to leave Rome more glorious than I found. And this shall be the most precious jewel in her crown. But back to our affair. This petition of your brother, suppose we do allow him to become Archbishop of Mainz. What a rich can be made. Ten thousand ducats, your holiness, is as much as I am empowered to contribute. Shall we say rather twelve thousand? A thousand ducats for each of the twelve apostles. Your Holiness, with all proper respect, there are but seven deadly sins. Seven thousand ducats, therefore. Ten thousand, then. A thousand for each of the ten commandments. My brother will be most pleased. As well he might be. First, we granted him the Archbishopric of Magdeburg when he was well under age. Then a dispensation to hold a second benefice, the Archbishopric of Halberstadt. And now, with this, we confirm him in a third, a triple benefice, so that he becomes, in addition to the other two, Archbishop of Magdeburg. Eternal blessing to your brother. We grant his petition and accept his contribution to the treasury of Christ's church. Provided, your holiness, provided, that is, that he promulgates throughout the German land a special jubilee and dunce, the proceeds of which shall be divided between your brother's treasury and mine. Equally, your holiness, Equal. Aleander, I name you Nuncio to mine, to arrange this blessing. Let the indulgence be drawn up, in turn somewhat broader than ordinary. For it gives our beloved Germans the privilege of helping to build St. Peter's Cathedral. Good Father Martin. Good Father Martin. 
So, I leave you to watch the film. It's very informative as far as how these um, modern day Protestant beliefs sprung up through Martin Luther and uh, I. So, the Roman Catholic Church teachings was, if it's not still is, that punishing oneself gets them closer to God. Martin, as you saw in the video, tried all men of such acts, but did not feel cleansed. To raise money for different projects as church buildings, in that case St. Peter's Cathedral was an example shown there, they also sold scenery mission certificates called indulgences. Martin was against this too. So he interpreted Romans 1 verse 17, the just shall live by faith, to form his faith-only doctrine, based on the practices that he was experiencing in his Catholic faith. Now note when he writes Sola in the side of the Bible, he was using it to support his objection to the importance of relics. He termed crutches, as taught by the Roman Catholic Church. He ought to have realised Romans 1.17 is a quote from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. And it was not written to be used as he used it, but had a totally different context. It, for one, related to Israel, who were taught and expected to keep the commandments and laws of God. So it wasn't by faith only. They had no relics. Such things were called idols and were outlawed. He, Martin Luther, was frankly wrong. He should have put Romans 1, 17 in context of Romans 2, verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So it is clear, Martin is wrong. All those subsequent denominations that followed him as today's are wrong. They've got their theologies being cut from the same cloth of error. The Bible is clear. Keep the commandments of God, not, Martha, not follow Martin Luther and such. Her ninth point. Quoting from her chosen James epistle, she mentions James 1.27, we again see she has taken the single verse out of its context of the whole. The epistle of James is famous for its clarity between faith and works. The major theme of the book is James's appeal to the believer that it is necessary to put outward actions with inward faith or else that kind of faith will accomplish nothing. That's in James 1.22. His recipients were laws, so were Jews, living outside Jerusalem in Gentile lands. So these epistles that people are writing from which she's quoting were written to Jewish people who were keeping the laws of God, or people who joined themselves to that faith, like Cornelius, for example. So let's see James 1 verse 1. James, a servant of God, and to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. And then verse 12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life, which Yahweh have promised to them that love him. And we are told elsewhere that those who love Yahweh keep his commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. James 1.22 But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves, like this lady. 
2.14 What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works, can say faith save him? In other words, James is saying no. 2.24 You see then how by works is a man justified and not by faith only. James 5.19 Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one converteth him, let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his ways or her ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. So clearly the context of James is we are not to remain in sin, not to remain transgressors of God's law, just holding on to faith and doing nothing else. So in context, the epistle should be clear. Do not be a sinner. We are, to, we are to convert sinners, transgress of God's laws and commandments, onto being non-sinners, i.e. keeping the laws. We are to obey God's instructions as to disobey is sin and death. John chapter 8, 34, Yeshua answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Uh, John, 1 John 3, 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil. 1 John 3, verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. It is clear when you put the whole Bible in context. So heard James 1.27 about what is pure religion was going the extra mile to being perfect, which has been more than a law keeper, the entry requirement under Revelation 22.14, the doers of the law. So James 1.27 is similar to Matthew 19.16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Yeshua, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Yeshua's answer, But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. There is a question, there is the answer. The young man said unto him, All these things I have kept from my youth up. What lack I? So the question was made, the answer was given. He wanted, What else can I do? Yeshua said unto him, if thou will be perfect, which is not if you want to get into, into eternal life, that was given. If thou to be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have trust in heaven and come and follow me. We read the same thing in Mark 10, 21. Then Yeshua, beholding him, beloved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, so whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have trust in heaven, and come and take thy cross and follow me. And again, in 18.22, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, come and follow me. So that's how you be perfect. That is this true religion that James is referring to. It is not the, the, just the criteria to get eternal life. So in conclusion, there is no unconditional, unconditional um, gift in the Bible, or as far as salvation is concerned. That is a false interpretation of theology, as I said, comes from Martin Luther. It amazes me the lack of logical thinking Christians have to believe salvation is a free gift teaching of the New Testament. Were that the case, everyone since the death of Yeshua, including atheists, would receive it. There would be no law, no sin, or need to mention it. No punishment, no one going to hell, etc. And the God of the Bible would be proven to be unjust. Punishing all the disobedient of his peculiar people, the seed of Abraham in the Old Testament, but freely granting it to Gentiles in the New Testament. If only they would stop following inherited theologies, such as of Martin Luther, and follow the Bible in which they claim to believe, they would see it is the same gospel, the oracles and way of salvation in both the Old and New Testament. It is the word of God as our guide. So, Hebrews 4, verse 2. For unto us, Paul speaking to New Testament believers, was the gospel preached as well as unto them. It's the same gospel. Acts chapter 7, 38. This is he that was in the church, congregation, in the wilderness, with the angel which spoke to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the library oracles to give unto us. So what they got in the Old Testament is the same thing in the New Testament. What Paul was referring to in Romans 10 verses 8 to 13, we saw is the same thing from Deuteronomy. So the verses of Revelations 14 verse 12 and 22 14 would be lies if 
what she believes was true, that all we need is faith. Because they specifically tell us we have to keep the commandments of God. So such believers are indeed their own worst enemy, the title of this uh, article. Fall under the description of Isaiah 30 verse 9, which says that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of Yahweh. We say to the seers or the pastors or whoever, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. You know, it's things we want to hear. Tell us what we want to hear, because that's how we'll, we'll follow. Anything that tells us we have to do anything more than just have faith, we don't want to do it. Second Timothy 3 verse 1. This know also, that in the last days, prevalent times shall come. Now, I've taken out some words from these verses just to make a point. Um, for men shall be unholy, it says. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, um, and so forth. Matthew 15 verse 8. This people draweth near unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And that is my view of what people are following today. So as with Paul in 2 Timothy 3 verse 15, Yeshua made it clear from where we are to learn about him. The law, the prophets and the Psalms of the Old Testament. In neither of those does it say he came to change or cancel God's law. See for example Luke chapter 16 verse 29 and chapters 24 verse 44. So in conclusion, before I give the, the, the um, links, 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 17, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So, shalom until we study again. Um, but I hope you will study to make yourself approved and not keep following traditions of present day denominations which are derived from Protestant of the Martin Luther era.